Hi, welcome to Our Think. I'm Lawrence Akers, and in this episode, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be going back to November 2016 when Our Think started, and we're going to be listening to some of those initial podcasts that we did, especially with uh, Daniel Cordner, Lisa Tawney, and with Joe Buzzardall. Um, in Daniel's case, we, we talked to him about what life was like uh, being diagnosed as HIV positive 12 years earlier, and what steps did he do to help find acceptance uh, and to be able to find that strength to go on to become a speaker for the HIV Speakers Bureau. Uh, we'll be chatting to Lisa Tawney, who is a sex therapist, um, all about those different labels, uh, the LGBT community. Uh, and we also chat to Joe Buzzardall about what it was like to wake up one day and find yourself pretty much disabled and, and how that impacted on his life. Um, it's a great opportunity now to go back and to listen to some of those initial episodes, especially for those people who may have only recently come on board with the podcast. Um, with that also, uh, our think um, is a podcast that isn't about generating revenue. It's all about being able to share ideas and discussions uh, and hopefully helping anyone who takes the time to listen. But with that, of course, um, bandwidth is narrow, broad, uh, and without wanting to spend money, we do have to look at ways in which we can make sure that we keep these podcasts in circulation without necessarily having to fork out. With that, it's part of the reason why this, uh, this compilation episode exists. But if you wish to go back and listen to those initial episodes in full, you can find them on YouTube uh, on our OutThink page there. Of course, if you haven't already signed up to the OutThink Facebook page, go there. All the episodes are there as well. Uh, and you can also find us on Spotify and on iTunes. And with that, let's go and have a bit of a chat to Daniel Corker. G'day, my name is Daniel Cordner. I'm a graphic designer. I'm a bike rider, I like to dig in the garden, vegetarian, I love to train handstands, and I've also been living with HIV for 11 years. Thanks, Danny. So, look, living with HIV for the past 11 years, obviously, it's something that's become a, a part of your life and something that you're, you're quite comfortable with. Let's start by perhaps going right back to the start and perhaps talking a little bit about what it was back then to be diagnosed HIV positive. So... I was diagnosed 11 years ago. HIV was a very different thing 11 years ago. So when I was first diagnosed, I was at a point in my life where I had a great job, had a great circle of friends. I felt like I was really starting to figure out who I actually was. And then one day I went for a regular checkup at my doctor and received my HIV diagnosis. At the time I walked out of there feeling alone, feeling scared, feeling uncertain and feeling like I'd made the biggest mistake in my entire life with no one to turn to. So at the time, for me, it was an incredibly difficult period to go through, as it is for everyone once they receive a HIV diagnosis. At the time when I was diagnosed, my doctor didn't really provide me with any information at all. And he, I guess he also implied that I was an inject injecting drug user, gave me a phone number to call it the Alfred, and then sent me on my merry way. I guess for me, I didn't really go out on my merry way. I basically went home, locked myself in my room and, and cried for the weekend until I, I guess I came out of that and eventually did tell someone. But that first particular diagnosis at that particular time, I think the doctor could have given me just a little bit more support or a little bit more information about services to tap into, or actually, I guess, handed me some brochures or some information on what it's like to be living with HIV. I guess I was really, I was questioning my future. I was questioning the decision that I'd made and the mistake that I'd made and what my future held. I guess because I was processing all this myself without anyone to talk to, I came to some very scary conclusions. I guess I almost went into a probably a state of paranoia where I was concerned about the circle of friends that I was close to that I'd possibly infected them with the virus. It, it, it sounds ludicrous now I think about it, but at the time I, I became quite paranoid about my exposure to other people and how to possibly put these people at risk and I'd possibly messed up their lives. And this was just a layering and a layering. I felt it wasn't just my life I'd messed up, but potentially many other people's lives that I'd messed up as well. Because the way that HIV is transmitted, there, there tends to be a lot of shame that's attached to that. 
How did you deal with that shame at that initial period? How much of an impact did it actually have on you? It had a pretty profound effect. For me, the greatest issue for shame for a start for me was that I retracted sexually. I didn't have sex for, for quite a long period of time. Because it was contracted through sex, I felt the best way to avoid that was not to have sex. 11 years ago, HIV was very different in regards to medication, undetectable viral loads, and also PrEP. It was, it was not even a conversation in the landscape of HIV at the time. So I guess there was still a lot of fear even around condom usage and HIV transmission. There was just always such a risk attached to sex and HIV transmission. And for me, I chose not to have sex. I didn't feel comfortable having sex with someone and I didn't, I didn't want to take the risk of possibly transmitting the virus to someone as well. So I think for me, that shame meant that I retracted sexually. I didn't have any partners for at least a 10 year period. And that was a very profound effect for me. It it, it took me a long time to, I guess, accept my own stigma and accept the virus, but also accept that I wasn't going to transmit the virus onto someone that I was having safer sex and that I wasn't putting people's lives at risk. But 11 years ago, I didn't understand that at all. So obviously being able to be um, open about your vulnerability uh, would be a massive step forward at that point. And I guess one of the first turning points for you would have been when you did start to share your HIV status with others. How did you decide who you should be sharing it with? When I started to tell people, I it was my closest friends that I wanted to tell. Because I have such a close, open relationship with people that are around me, I was really concerned about me starting to shut down and close down and, and closet a part of my life that I wasn't having this open, honest relationships with people that I was used to. And, and I loved that and I treasured that so much that I didn't want the virus to also then hinder those friendships, the honesty and openness that came with that. I have a, a very close circle of friends and I guess I started with some of my closest friends. Some of my closest friends or majority of my closest friends don't sit within the LGBTI community. They sit within the, the straight community. And for me, when I first started to tell people, I was very aware that I also then had to take on the role of educating people around HIV as well. I feel if I was maybe having the conversation with a bunch of gay mates, they would have at least had a base knowledge of HIV. But once I first told people, I also had to explain to them that it was okay. I was still going to live. It wasn't a death sentence anymore. I still had all my challenges and ups and downs over this 11 year period. But I guess I chose those people on the basis that I also needed their friendship. I needed their support. And I had to take that risk in sharing something with them that maybe they didn't understand in the hope that maybe the friendship was far greater than their concerns and their fears around something they knew nothing about. And I was very lucky that that was the case, that all my friends supported me regardless and and have helped me to this day with acceptance and also I guess what also really helped at the particular time was seeing people's reactions. Nobody ever reacted badly to me. Nobody ever ran away. Nobody ever stopped kissing me or touching me or hugging me. Nobody ever did any of that. And this was back 11 years ago when there were still great concerns around HIV through touch or sharing coffee cups or whatever that may be. So I think for me, over a period of time, the support these friends gave and their acceptance helped me develop a greater acceptance of the virus as well and also start to let go of some of my fears of transmitting the virus to other people. You mentioned before the shame of your past. What things did you do to dismantle that shame, to to resolve it? That's a good question. For me to dismantle the shame, for a start, I guess primarily, I had to accept that I was HIV positive. And I thought that I'd accepted it, but I actually really hadn't. I think the real defining point there was once I came back from travel and I was told I had two AIDS-defining illnesses. I had oral candida and I had PCP pneumonia. 
And while I thought that I was okay with accepting that I'm HV positive, to be told that I had AIDS defining illnesses, I kind of just, I panicked. It's like, oh shit, I'm really not ready to accept that I have, it's progressed to the next level. And I guess through that, I really had to accept, well, this is something that is living within me that I, prior to travel, I guess I'd see my doctor every three months and I'd have my regular blood tests. And that was my little reality check. But the remainder of the three months, I didn't actually really need to acknowledge it. I didn't need to talk about it and I didn't need to really do much about it. The virus was technically living in harmony with my body. Once I came back from travel, started taking medication every day, for me, that was also a really great reminder because each morning I take a tablet and I don't ponder it for hours on end, but it's just that little reminder of the fact that there is a virus living in my body and I need to pay attention to that. And I also need to acknowledge it and accept that as well too. And so for me, that pill is a good daily reminder of what I need to do in that acknowledgement. And so I guess, yeah, dismantle the shame that is attached to that. Once upon a time, I probably would have never have taken a pill in front of somebody. Now it's fine. So it's sort of, I guess it's looking at it with different light. And as opposed to me being concerned about what other people will think, if I'm okay with it, then I can share that with other people. I find it interesting also hearing your story that for a lot of people, I'll say that shame can be dismantled when you are able to speak it, when you're able to talk it and it's greeted by like-minded people without judgment. Yep. And in those moments, shame can be completely destroyed. Yep. And, you know, you're talking before about being able to talk about it and finding in those moments that there's a bit of a release around that. Mm. Given that you've also gone on to become a speaker. Yeah. How do you feel about getting up in front of people nowadays and talking about HIV? Now I love it. If you had have asked me 11 years ago that this is where I'd be today, I would have laughed at you and said, no, not me, someone else. I... For me, being a public speaker, for a lot of people, that comes with all sorts of challenges that you've got to overcome your your fear, your nerves, the anxiety, and also just bearing your soul on a stage of people that could be sitting out there and judging you. What has come out of that for me is that because I feel so empowered each time I do a talk, whether it's to a school group, whether it's a peer support group, whoever that may be, I feel quite empowered by confidently sharing my story and I'm not talking about, you know, a touch upon the hardships and the difficult times, but I also talk about the great things that have come of that. And I think then by sharing the story, people can start to see that. They can see that, yes, the diagnosis was difficult and there's been challenges, but you've been able to overcome that. You've also been able to overcome your health issues through successful medication, and you've been able to overcome your your own stigma and internalized issues around HIV through through counseling services. So I think people see the story, they they hear the hard parts, but they also see who I am today, and I've become a better person because of that. So I think once I'm standing in front of a, a school group, if I wasn't so comfortable with HIV, I don't think I'd be able to do the story justice, but I think through speaking about it so confidently, people then become curious about it. I actually had a friend on Facebook recently. It was the first time I'd publicly posted something about my HIV status on Facebook and a friend that lives up in Brisbane, hadn't spoken to for a long period of time, picked up on it, sent me a personal message and was like, shit, I just saw your message. I just want to make sure you're okay. I'm really concerned about you. And it was really lovely to kind of, I didn't chuckle at all, but I kind of just went, I get where she's coming from and it's it's really sweet, but I just wanted to email her back and say, thank you so much for your concern. That's really beautiful, but it's actually okay. I'm going to live as long as you and I'm going to live as healthy a life as you. There's challenges involved in there, but it felt really empowering to be able to share that with her and share that with her confidently that I was going to be okay because she had greater fears than what I had, but I could understand her fears. But through my acceptance, through my public speaking, through my own education around STIs and HIV and treatments and everything linked to HIV, 
I was able to confidently just let her know it's going to be okay. And and that was enough for her. You mentioned at the start that obviously HIV now is very different to HIV back then. And a lot of that is thanks to the advancements in, in modern medicine, um, particularly PrEP as well, uh, and PEP, and of course all the medications that people that are positive can take to help become uh, undetectable. Tell us a little bit more about your thoughts around those. I am a total advocate for PrEP, um, PEP as well. Um, for me, I've said to quite a few people in recent times that in the conversation around PrEP, I always say if I had that chance to take PrEP 11 years ago, I would have done it in a flash. I would not have hesitated at all. At the time, 11 years ago, I didn't have that choice. PrEP wasn't around. PEP was around at the time, but I guess I didn't really, I wasn't as educated as what I am now and I wasn't as heavily involved in the gay community, so I didn't understand enough about PEP at the time. I always say to a lot of people, why would you not want to lend a hand in helping eradicate new transmissions? Everyone can play a part in this. I feel very passionate about PrEP because it is a dual responsibility. It's no longer my responsibility and solely my responsibility as a HV positive person to only manage that. Everyone out there in the gay community can play a part in that. And I guess the, the dream or the goal for, for many people within the gay community, many people living with HIV is to end transmissions. A lot of people talk about a cure or a vaccine and Oh, I'd, I'd love that as well. For me, the greatest concern right now is reducing new transmissions. And I play my part in that because I take medication every day. I have an undetectable viral load and the risk is next to zero for me as far as being able to transmit that to someone. So what I love about PrEP is it means that it's also the negative people. It's their responsibility as well, that it doesn't just sit with me. So for me, that's why... I'm a great believer of PrEP in what it can actually do for the community as opposed to in negative people blaming positive people or positive people being stigmatized for passing on the virus. PrEP allows people to take that mutual responsibility and for me that is the best solution in the world. When you consider that we have this massive acronym LGBTQIA+. Mm. And that has grown significantly over the last decade, especially. Why do you think it is that we continue to reach out into new labels, new areas there? Well, I think it's reflective of changing social norms, Lawrence. It's, um, you know, People have far more varied interests now. Um, media plays a big part as well in our changing social norms. There's more representation in the media now of uh, people in the LGBTI community and there's more awareness. And so with more awareness, I think there's also um, some studies say there's more acceptance as well and less stigma around uh, people uh, who want to express themselves in various ways. I think back to the 90s when I was on the gay scene then, mm. and I recall there being quite a bit of um, internalised phobia within the community yep. around certain other sections of the community. Mm. Do you think as it becomes more diverse that we may see that internalised phobia decrease or is it likely perhaps to increase? I like to think that it's decreasing. Um, it's You have to be careful not to talk in generalisations, I think, uh, around this because in everybody's experience is individual. And for some people, uh, they may feel shame and stigma and other people may feel completely supported by others. So it's... It's all a bit relative, I think, but I like to think that, um, as I say, with more of a sort of public acceptance around people's sexual expressions, that there is some lessening of those judgmental attitudes for people. 
I know in my own experience of talking to people that I'll describe sexuality as being at one end of the scale you have 100% gay, mm. the other end of the scale you have 100% straight, and in the middle there you have this incredible diversity of different mm. preferences and, and orientations. This obviously is respective of or reflective of Kinsey. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that landmark. Mm. Well, the Kinsey reports back in the 50s uh, were groundbreaking and quite controversial. And he did a continuum of sexual orientation. And at the time, that was suggested that sexuality had a fixed orientation and therefore a limited variability and fluidity in sexual orientation. And But what we're now seeing is that there's more language now around sexual identity labels that reflects these societal attitudes and changes. And you're right, it was, where did you fall on the Kinsey scale? And Kinsey, his research was uh, massive. He interviewed just you know, hundreds, thousands of people over the course of his career. And when his first report came out, people were shocked to see um, how much interest there was in uh, bisexual sexual activity, attraction to um, people of your same gender, um, along with a lot of other activities that uh, that people may have been doing but not actually acknowledging that they were involved in. So it lifted the lid pretty much on what was happening in America at the time, um, met with quite a lot of consternation and uh, also had funding pulled. Um, there's a terrific film called Kinsey, mm which is a really great um, insight to his work and the passion that he had to try to learn more and um, discover more about sexual functioning and behaviour. Let's talk about bisexuality. Mm. Uh, I have had debates with people in the past about if bisexuality even exists, mm -hmm. which I find an interesting mm. debate. As, as I think I said to you earlier, it's not like you know, fairies at the back of the garden or mm. trolls living under a bridge. <laughs> Bisexuals really do exist. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's more about if people believe that they truly are bisexual mm. or if this is some kind of stepping stone mm. from, you know, a transitioning from being straight to being gay. Mm. What's been your experience around bisexuality? Again, it's an individual uh, experience, isn't it? It's uh, some people will, as we talked about earlier, be transitioning, uh, say men perhaps who may have been uh, in a female relationship, identified as straight, uh, maybe had children, um, later in their life realised that they were attracted to men and may have always felt that way but didn't feel through societal pressures that they could express their sexuality and later on realised that they did want to come out and, and live as gay men. Um, there are other people who... I think struggle with uh, feeling if you're not attracted equally to men and women, 50% either, uh, you're, are you really truly bisexual um, and have grappled with some difficulties around that. So, uh, again, it's, it's different things to different people, I think. It's interesting you say that kind of 50-50 split. I mean, mm. is there a ratio that allows you to be <laughs> truly by, like, is, do you have to be like a 70% minimum? Uh, yeah. You know, it, it seems like a strange way to kind of view it. Yeah, I think that's just a societal pressure. Well, if you like men and women, you must like them equally. And if you don't like them equally, then you're really not truly a bisexual person. Um, or if you like men 75% and women only 25%, um, well, maybe it's just a phase you're passing through. So uh, I think old school thinking might have thought that was more of a 50-50 thing, but I think that there's much more um, fluidity around that now where people maybe don't feel as pigeonholed into, I need to feel attracted equally. And I think that in some ways, you know, I don't feel sympathy. I think that'd be mm. kind of descending. Mm. But I do feel empathy for uh, the bisexuals that exist because mm. of the fact that in some ways they're kind of shunned from the gay community mm. and the straight community. They're, they're mm. kind of said, the gay community kind of says to them, look, you're, you're kidding yourself. You're mm. actually gay and you're not really 
uh, attracted to both. And you mm. have the straight community that will generally say, well, why are you associating with these freaks of nature? Of course, mm. this is a vast generalization I'm talking about. Here. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we just need to, you know, lift mm. up a, a bigger picture here. Yeah. Um, but I do feel that that tends to happen. There's these internalized phobias that exist on both sides of the camp yeah. that are projected onto people who choose to be bisexual. Yeah. Or who identify as bisexual. That's a choose to be bisexual is a terrible yeah. phrase. <laughs> yes, isn't it? <laughs> here I am publicly slapping my own wrist. Uh, I'll slap it from here. How's that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, Lawrence, you, you've hit the, you know, hit right on the head there because uh, even just last week I read two articles. Uh, one was in the Star Observer and one was in MCV. Uh, talking around what it's like to be, one article is about being married and bisexual and uh, passing as straight and the privilege of being bisexual and uh, really interesting reading both articles. Um, and in particular, I was interested to read uh, about James and Rebecca Dominguez, who are the driving force behind Bisexual Alliance Victoria. And in their article, they said they've, they've been marching at Pride March for 10 years and they've had biphobic abuse hurled at them from the crowd. Um, and only in two of those 10 years have they not had abuse. So that's eight. And, and so when you think about Pride March being uh, an incredible celebration of the community's diversity, um, and I'd like to think acceptance, it's, it's interesting that they are experiencing this level of, uh, of biphobia. Um, and so, yeah, there are some attitudes out there that, uh, you know, you're fence sitting, you, you have to choose one or the other. Uh, and I've had conversations with, um, with people as well, you know, friends. And there's also been some strong views there that, that bisexuality is a choice that you should be making. You should choose one or the other. You shouldn't be, you know, really able to feel both. And I think that comes from a few different things, and that may come from someone's view that they can't imagine themselves being attracted to, you know, if you're same-sex attracted, then they might not be able to understand how you could possibly be attracted to um, mm. someone of the opposite sex. So, so you know, the views are clouded by their uh, own beliefs, obviously. It is very black and white thinking yeah. to play there. Like you're either yeah. gay or straight and you can't be in yeah. between. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can't um, be the meat in that sandwich. You cannot be the meat in that sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and let's face it, sometimes it's great to be the meat in the sandwich. Mm. And, um, and you know, people often do get to be the meat in the sandwich, but um, why does that have to be limited to certain genders involved? So for people out there who do feel that they may not be fully in touch with who they are mm. in that sense of a label, what suggestions would you have for them to help explore who they are a little bit more fully? Mm. I'd say talk to someone. Um, we've got so much support available now to us that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago. There's telephone services in particular. I think that's a great starting point. Um, obviously, counsellors and sex therapists as well are, are fantastic people to talk to about things. Um, we trained to explore you know, the emotions and um, and help people around any confusion uh, they might be feeling or even about how to come out as well. But um, rather than just sitting here spruiking my services, I, I think often phone services are a fantastic first point of call um, and online forums perhaps as well with other other people. The, the world is at our fingertips. Information is available now like we've never had it before. And um, I can remember years ago when I was a telephone counsellor with the uh, AIDS line, which uh, doesn't exist anymore, um, back in the 90s, we were inundated, absolutely inundated with, with calls. Um, I worked there for about four years, then went back in 2000, early 2003, and I'd do a two-hour shift, Lawrence, and not get one phone call. And that's because the internet was around, and it really showed me just how much support is out there. So I think that's a wonderful starting place for people to um, talk about things and um, and if you know anybody to talk to them um, but obviously you know you have to trust in that 
relationship as well. Trust is very important because once you tell someone something, your information is out there. So you want to know that the person you told can hold that for you. We lose control of that. When we share information, we automatically lose control of where that information goes. However, if that sharing can be greeted with some empathy and, mm. and, and lack of judgment, yeah. it's going to help to remove any of that shame that's associated with that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't want people to, um, you know, have their feelings of shame compounded by the response of another. So I guess like anything, choose the person that you share things with carefully. I think Switchboard is a wonderful reference for people to turn to. Mm. Uh, apart from offering phone counselling for free, yeah. uh, they will have a, a list of different resources that people might be able to tap into mm. to help further their exploration a little bit further. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I also work, Lawrence, at Mind Australia, and we've just started a new LGBTI service specifically catering to the needs of the community. Um, and we're just getting that up and running now. So we're very excited about the um, opportunities for people to come and see us, um, to see sex therapy and counselling with me. We have psychologists there as well, experienced um, in the community, and practitioners with lived experience, so people who have a really good understanding of the issues uh, facing the community, and some of them have dealt with things themselves, obviously. So I'd highly recommend that people tap into services that are LGBTI-specific. Um, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Joe Buzzatil and I'm also a clinical hypnotherapist, counsellor and lecturer. So tell us a little bit about your story there in terms of what, what has happened over the past couple of years. Um, well, I um, I was on holidays, actually I was off to um, one of the Atlantis cruises in Asia and I was in Singapore probably about 18 months ago and I discovered or I started to experience uh, weakness of the muscles in my leg and I stopped walking, being able to walk. So through that experience, I had to come back from the trip. I didn't get to go on the cruise, which is unfortunate. And I ended up going to hospital and finding out that I had a condition called, or I've got a condition called vasculitis, which is a it's a nerve condition and it sort of falls in the family of MS and neuromotor disease. But the good thing is that this condition is, is curable. And yeah, so it's been a bit of a journey to learn how to walk again, to, you know, surrender and give up a lot of things that I would normally do. And now, you know, reestablish myself back on the world, back on the gay scene, back on the gay world in a way. So what did you really notice was different between where you were prior to this illness and when the disability was at its full flight? Um, well, I guess the, the first, if I can compare it to um, the medical part of it, I think I, you know, I didn't notice the sign. So before I got sick, I probably had these signs that were telling me that I was going to get sick. Mm. So, for example, I experienced twitching of the eye and at one point there was like a blurriness of my left eye. I experienced pains down my left arm. I was constantly tired and I, I just considered those to be being overworked because I was working a lot. And the thing that I've learned through this process is that I, you know, I used to think that stress was um, only um, a negative feeling, but I was having, I was obviously in stress because I was working long hours and not eating well, but I didn't really consider it to be stress. So that was probably the first thing that I had all these signs going on, but I was quite active. I had quite a full life. I was, you know, loving my job, busy and then getting sick, everything had to stop. So that was, that was a really big thing that I had to get used to. Like, you know, I had to move back in with my parents, you know, cause I couldn't walk. I had to cut back on my work. I didn't see my friends cause I couldn't be social. So everything changed. So, um, it was sort of like a new me was created in a way. So what kind of uh, thoughts did you have during that time? Like, I mean, I, I imagine that suddenly finding yourself being unable to walk would be quite confronting for most people. Yeah. What kind of things were you, you, you thinking and telling yourself at that time? Well, it's interesting, Lawrence, because you would think that I would have been freaked out, but I wasn't. I got I got freaked out probably eight months later. So I think because I'm a therapist and because I've done a lot of work on myself mentally, I was sort of like prepared. I thought, okay, well, this is the way it is. And 
I was positive. I sort of kept myself in a positive state of mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but what had happened was um, I was planning to go to America in December of that year that I got sick. So I got sick in March and the doctor had told me that I could go. And then when it came closer to December and the doctor said, you can't go, that's when it hit me that I was sick. So it's really unusual. So from March till about December, I was really positive. I was eating well. I was doing all the right stuff. And then I probably went into a bit of depression or a bit of, not anxiety, but a little bit of self-doubt in December and January, that summer. So the summer of 2015 and 16, I was then, it impacted me and I probably had a relapse. So I sort of had the second stage of being sick where um, my mind was part of it. My mind became part of the illness. Um, Yeah, so... It's interesting because I I guess for some people, they may not have the tools to deal with being ill or being disabled. um, So they end up going into that sort of panic state. Well, I sort of found that I didn't do that. And I never really panicked, but I sort of became more doubtful that I was going to get better a a lot later. And and I wouldn't want to assume um, that I would know what kind of emotions that an event or a circumstance like this would bring up. I I would assume that something like, frustration and anger would be appropriate but what kind of range of emotions did this experience bring up for you again for a greater question it's um the, the main thing that i felt which may not make sense to the listeners is it wasn't emotions based around my condition it was emotions based around being abandoned by a lot of my friends and a lot of my gay friends so that's the the thing that I probably faced the most that was I could deal with you know not walking I actually in a way got really sort of used to the disability quickly because you know I could watch Game of Thrones and just sit in bed and get my dinner made for me and I sort of looked at it as a bit of a a break I always believed that I was going to get better and there were days when it was frustrating so they're the medical things. It was frustrating. I had to learn to be patient. So there was a little bit of intolerance there. Like, when am I going to get better? But I learned really quickly to surrender. But I couldn't come put my head around the abandonment part where I'm talking about best friends not ringing me or not returning my calls or not see, coming to see me. And that that was a hard thing. And so I tried to put my head around, is it because they couldn't cope with the illness or is it because they wanted fun Joey only? So, and I still don't know the answer. Is this something that you're you're still working through at the moment? Well, I think I'm coming to the end of it because I just, you know, I did a big Facebook cull and I just, you know, I'm not, I've deleted those people out of my phone book. It did take me all this time to come to that conclusion. You know, at the beginning, I was, I guess I was t- taking it personally and I was sort of, thinking there was a lot of why questions but now I'm not asking those why questions anymore because I know it's not about me it's about them and you know maybe the getting ill was um another way for myself to learn that you know new things are evolving in my life I'm changing you know like I'm not the same person anymore you know once upon a time I could walk and jump and run and dance and do all those things. And now I can't do a lot of those things. And so it changes you as a person. And I don't want to go back to what I was before because I've learned so much through this experience. I mean, think simple things like compassion and gratitude. And you know, if I could just, you know, teach or show everyone how we take things in life for granted, that would be the biggest joy because you don't realize un- unless you are in it. You know, and that's one thing that I've learned about compassion is that you don't really understand when someone says I've got cancer or someone says, oh, you know, someone's died or someone's ill. You don't know what they're going through because you don't know. So when you go through something of trauma and crisis yourself, I had to realize that people don't know what I'm going through. And one of the other things I guess that was difficult was in the early stages, I lost a lot of weight. So it was obvious that I was sick. But then as I started to look normal again, people just assumed that I was okay. When I started learning how to walk again, people assumed that I was okay, but they had no real comprehension of the pain that I was in or the, you know, little things like it, take, it took an hour to get dressed or, you know, the fact that I still couldn't bend my knees or climb stairs. So, so people then dismiss that you're sick. And so that's why I'm thinking that could be another reason why people abandoned um, me or or they sort of didn't make contact 
Yeah. And I don't know if it's a gay thing or not, um, because I found that a lot of my straight friends, a lot of girls especially, they all stepped up, but it's the gay boys that sort of stepped away. So I don't know. I still, I'm still trying to figure that out. So I guess you're kind of at an advantage in a sense that you are a therapist. And so your ability to understand how the mind works and how emotions play with that is potentially far greater than people who aren't therapists. So this question is kind of two part in a really long winded way. Um, firstly, what did you do that you found worked for you to, to help keep you going through this condition? And secondly, for listeners out there who may be experiencing this, who may have found themselves in this situation recently, what advice would you give to them to help them to cope? Um, the thing that kept me going was my family, I think, and those close friends. I was very, very lucky that I stumbled across a guy called Sarion White online who is a spiritual guide and a course facilitator. And I just, you know, happened to see an email where he was selling his $900 course for $29.99 and I bought it. And I have to say with all my heart that that changed my life because his whole course was called Engaging in the Flow. And it was like the universe told me, or gave me that as a gift because I did the course and it was all about surrendering. It was all about not attaching. It was all about being in the moment. It was all about trusting that you're going to be okay. Even if you've got money or you've got no money, even if you're disabled or you can run, everything is possible. So it was like the right time. So he helped me because once I grasped those concepts and yes, I agree, I'm a therapist, but being a therapist doesn't mean that I'm capable of actually telling myself to be okay. I feel like he told me that I was okay. So that helped. Um, and that, so I believe that even though I didn't know if I was going to walk again, that there was possibility for me to make my life anything I want to be in that situation. I had my mind, which was a good, it was a good thing. My mind was still sharp. So that was good. So I think that's what got me through that. And I also am a strong believer that I was meant to go through this change. I didn't think I was going to go through this change via disability. Woof, that was a big one. But I knew that I was going to go through a change because I could feel something before I got sick that I wasn't happy with. You know, funnily enough, even though I say my friends abandoned me, I think the reality was that I wanted to get rid of them anyway. But I didn't know how. You know, I wasn't satisfied with some of the things I was doing. I didn't know how to change that. So that sort of got me through as well, thinking, well, okay, the universe was obviously trying to give me warning signs, but I didn't listen. So then it said, stop, Joe, we're going to make you do it. So that got me through believing that concept. Um, the second part of the question, I guess, is what would I advise people to do? And funnily enough, one of my closest friends, like, just recently broke his some vertebrae through a, in a car accident. And it's like he's me 18 months ago. And so I'm actually do, uh, doing that, uh, you know, I'm fulfilling this question daily with him. I'm giving him advice that I wish I had. So the advice that I would give if someone is faced with a crisis is firstly, you need to stop. You know, I think we're either trained or we, we believe that we need to run still. We need to sort of avoid it. So face it, surrender and necessarily face the fact and tell yourself I'm broke or I've just broken up with someone or I'm, I've got anxiety or I'm disabled. Whatever the situation is, is face it. Because then in that reality is when the solutions come. When you're, you know, trying to hide it or trying to run away from it or, you know, in my friend's case, for example, I mean, he broke his back. Six weeks ago, he broke his back and he's thinking that he's, he's going to get better tomorrow. And, you know, so rea realizing that it's going to take a while for his bones to fuse back together, for his nerves to work, for him to be able to stand up again properly is, is, is the surrendering. So that's a really big lesson for me. And I use that now with all my clients is that we are either victims or creations of a society that is so impatient. Mm. We want everything now. On top of that, I think gay men want everything even quicker. So, you know, that's the thing. It's like, how do you just accept the fact that you were once, you know, dancing under a mirror ball and now you're being bathed by your mother? Or how do you accept the fact that you were once sexually active and now you're, you know, not? 
again, it's all surrendering because it doesn't mean that it's going to be like that forever. And that's the biggest thing that I've learned from this is that what I experienced March last year to now is that it's, it's changed. So much has changed. The things that I couldn't do a year ago, I can do now. But, and it feels like a blink, Lawrence. It doesn't feel like it was a year ago. It feels like it was just a blink. So that's a really important thing is that, yes, people say time goes quickly, but at the same time, time also is where you learn and where you d- develop. And, you know, that's, there's, that's why they call it growth. You can't grow without going through something. You were talking about the warning signs as well uh, earlier about your own warning signs and, and just thinking you're working hard and, and getting overstressed. For people out there that are listening and thinking, I hear myself here, I, I, I hear that I've got these warning signs happening, what would you say to them? Well, I'd say that you, um, when you notice something and you, you know yourself that you're noticing it, just take a moment again to stop and just really understand what that is. I mean, I look back now and think, how stupid was I? I was going blind in one eye and I still got on a plane and went to San Diego to go to a conference. And I remember walking through the streets of San Diego at 7.30 at night blind as a bat, right? I couldn't see. It was so dark. And I'm thinking, I'm in an unknown area. You know, I could be walking into a, anything. And, you know, that was a big sign. You know, um, if, for example, you're, you know, the other signs are thoughts, you know, um, you know, I can go into this a lot deeper, but I'll just, as a quick version of it, is that I think that it's your values are speaking to you, or you want to call that your intuition. You know, they're signs. And I think that a lot of us don't listen to our intuition, especially when it comes to behavioral things like, you know, you're, I shouldn't be doing that, but you do it anyway. I shouldn't be having that drug or that cigarette or that cookie or that, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken because I want to, you know, be healthy or I want to lose weight or I want to have a better life. But we do it anyway. And that, is it laziness? I don't know. But, you know, the thing is, is that I think to move forward in this day and age with things moving so fast is that you need to pay attention to those signs. Because I believe through my own experience that as the signs accumulate, you then face a crisis. And the crisis is when you have to stop, you know, and that could be a number of different things. For me, it was being in a wheelchair and not walking. But for another person, it may be getting depression or it could be, you know, breaking up with someone and not knowing what to do. It could be not having any money. It's the, it's that crisis that makes you change. So I don't know. I don't know what more to sort of how to, how else to prompt people to actually notice. I mean, you've got to find time in your day in a busy life that we live just to stop through meditation or through just being alone and quiet just to, to listen. I think also there's an element of self-worth in there as well. I, I know some people who are constantly unwell, who constantly complain about ill health. And if I raise with them, you should really get that looked at. The response I get back is, oh, no, I'll be all right. I'll be yeah. all right. That's another thing of society, isn't it? It is, isn't it? And it's almost like, well, you might be all right, but you might not mm. as well. And so, you know, not that I want to take worst case scenario or be a prophet of doom, but you certainly want to be able to be accountable for your own health when you start to notice that it's declining. Well, I think that, um, again, I'm only um, getting this information from being a therapist, so I don't know if it's true or not. But like I know from this, my clients is that a lot of people would rather put worth on other things than themselves. And I think that's a normal Western culture thing. What I learned when I got sick was, you know, meditation and sound therapy and being quiet really helped. So I now religiously wake up at five o'clock and meditate. And like the days I don't, I notice the difference. So it takes a bit of courage and commitment to listen to those signs. I think that if people pay attention, they're lucky because they're going to avoid the crisis. But if they don't, the crisis will come in one way or another. It may not come tomorrow or next week, but it will come again, I just think that we're living in a world that's so fast that we can't sustain the speed. You know, if you notice just, just in my own family, for example, I'm noticing more and more people getting sick as well. Like, you know, with really like cancers and brain tumors and all that. I'm thinking like, why is it happening all of a sudden? And, you know, it could be what we're eating. It could be the health, you know, not having time to exercise. It could be that we're watching more TV. It could be that we're looking at our iPhones more often and, All those sort of things are going to accumulate. They're all, you know, if someone, for example, is looking at their iPhone all the time, he's got a sore neck, then you would think that he'd go and get a massage or you'd think that that person might say, 
I'm going to have a break from my iPhone, but we don't. And that's the difficult thing. How do we get someone to pay attention? So thank you for listening to this special retrospective of OutThink from Danny Cordner, Lisa Tawney, and Joe Buzzardall. Next month, we'll be back with a brand new guest. Thank you for listening. We'll speak to you then. Take care.